<clears throat> so uh, today we'll go over uh, rings of fractions, modules of fractions. So some motivation to start that consider the simplest ring Z. So this is a ring, but it's not uh, a field. So not uh, many integers are not invertible. Actually, there are only two integers that are invertible in this ring structure. But can we construct the smallest possible field uh, containing Z? So it's natural to think about what this question says. Uh, it's naturally, this is the rationals. So some somebody might think, how do we construct the rationals, uh, a natural field from this very natural ring Z? So you can just take every uh, non-zero integer and just say magically it's invertible, and then we'll be done. We will have gotten Q from Z, the rationals from the integers. So um, this has a generalization. Um, so it's not always uh, that simple, but the idea comes from that. So the topic for today is gonna to be mostly rings of fractions, um, modules of fractions. So if we say let A be a ring, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is chapter three in Atiyah McDonald. So the modules and tens of product was chapter two, now we're on chapter three. So uh, let A be a ring and let's say, let S be a multiplicatively closed subset of uh, A. It doesn't have to be a ring or anything like that. So in this case, for to be a multiply closed subset, you have to have one as an element of S. So <clears throat> with commutative ring theory, you have to have one as an uh, element of this S or else it doesn't make sense. And then uh, for each, um, to elements of S, I want the product to be in S, and that's all. So now we can construct this new rank. All elements of the form A over S. So just like how we constructed the rationals from the integers, you just made some sort of fractions, we do something very similar. So. Um, in this case, the fractions come from S, sorry, the denominators come from S and the numerators come from A. So two elements in S inverse A are equal if and only if there exists, I'll say S little prime in S such that, and you'll see where the, um, motivation from the rationals comes, you cross multiply these terms in the fractions, multiply by S and then set it equal to zero. So yes, this is the, thank, yes, yes, thank you, thank you, yes. So this um, S double prime from S has to kill this cross product, yes. So you can check on your own that this in fact is a well-defined uh, relation. <clears throat> so we can make uh, S inverse A into a ring in the natural operations. So uh, addition A over S plus A prime over S prime is gonna be kind of like you get the common denominator and then you add them together just like in the rationals. And then you multiply them, just multiply the numerators together and multiply the denominators together, just like in the rationals. And so now the zero is going to be zero over one. Actually, it's actually equal to any zero over S, just like the rationals. And the one is going to be one over one. It's actually equal to uh, any S over S, just like in the rationals. And then maybe I shouldn't have drawn so big. The negative is going to be negative A over S, just like in the rationals.
<clears throat> so this new idea is called uh, localization. We say that S inverse A is the localization of the ring A at the uh, subset S. So it's kind of like we only view S as just the denominators. So, so note that all elements in S inverse A of the form, let's say uh, S over S prime, or S, sorry, S and S prime, or S are in fact invertible. But it doesn't necessarily mean S inverse A, the localization, is in fact a ring. It's, uh, it's in fact a field. That's not necessarily true. But all um, fractions of this type, where both numerator and denominator are from S, are in fact invertible. They're units. So uh, some, some properties of the ring. Um, so just like how we talk about rings, we also like to talk about the ideals of the ring. So the proper ideals of S inverse A are ideals of the form S inverse I. Such that I is an ideal of A and the I does not intersect with S. If it does intersect with S, then it has an element like we saw here, and therefore it's invertible, so the ideal would not be proper. Um, similarly, um, proper can be replaced by prime. And so in the case of uh, a prime ideal, so prime ideals of S inverse A are of the form, sorry, they are of the form S inverse P such that P intersect S is empty and P is a prime ideal of A. Okay, so <clears throat> you have some rings, you have some ideals. So we kind of defined localization as just an abstract idea, but we will kind of show you precisely really which types of sets that uh, algebraists, number theorists, algebraic geometers really like to focus on to localize. So, uh, so how about we say, um, more so like examples. So if A is an integral domain, then that means uh, there are no zero divisors. In other words, S being all the non-zero elements of A is an um, multiplicatively closed subset of A because clearly one is an S and if you have X and Y and A such that X and Y are both non-zero then x times y is not zero. That's what it means for a ring to be an integral domain. So then uh, s being the complement of zero is multiplicatively closed. So uh, in this case, we say s inverse a is the field of fractions of a. And you can see like, from my motivating example, the rational is in fact a field of fractions of the integers. It's the most natural way to construct a localization if your ring is 
and an integral domain. But that's not always the case. So uh, there's a, li a little bit more of a generalization. So that was number one. Let's say there's number two. So uh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So if let's say P is a prime ideal of a ring A, then I claim the complement of P is multiplicatively closed. That's clear to see because one is an element of S, one is not in it's it is not in P, and then two, if uh, X and Y are not in the prime ideal, then X times Y is not in the prime ideal. That's from the definition of the prime ideal. That's construction of the prime ideal. So S being the complement of a prime ideal and A is in fact multiplicatively closed. From here, uh, we say, let S inverse A be denoted as A sub P. <clears throat> right, so from now on, when you see A sub P, doesn't mean localize at the set, the prime ideal, localize at the complement. So this actually, we just say is, um, I'll just say not let, let's say denote, denote this in the case where S is the complement of the prime, S inverse A is <clears throat> A sub P. This is the localization of a ring A at a prime. So these examples are very important. They come up all the time. So let's look at uh, ideals in this case. So uh, what I just say actually. Proper ideals of A sub P are of the form I sub P, something of this form, I is in I, S is in A, without P, I'll say I is an ideal of A such that um, A, sorry, P, sorry, I was doing it right the first time. Um, I does not intersect A complement P, but that means that I P, proper ideals of the form I sub P such that I is an ideal contained in um, A, sorry, not A, contained in P. What can we say, what, what's another thing we can say about this um, new ring, A sub P? We can also say that A sub P is a local ring because all the proper ideals are contained in this ideal. P sub P, which is all of the elements of the form X over S, where X is in P, but S is not in P. So uh, localizing at a prime is extremely important. Okay, and so that's my second example. What about my third example? <clears throat> How about we let, um, sorry, let me say, let F be an element of A. There's another way to localize. So um, let S be all the powers of F. So clearly S is multiplicatively closed. So we can localize at, um, how about I say denote, we can localize A at S 
in this case, we denote it as a sub f. f is that element we started with. <coughs> So it's elements of the form x over s, such that x is an a, and then s is some power of f. It could equal 1. So <clears throat> let's see some practicality of localization. So localization is not just an abstract idea. It does have some applications. So um, theorem, how about we say we want to prove that uh, statement that we mentioned before uh, in our first week, but we did not prove. At least I don't think we proved it. So um, I'll say x in A. So I'll say let A be a ring. I'll say x in A is no potent. If and only if x is contained in every prime ideal of A. How do we do this? So uh, what about this direction? This direction is rather easy. So uh, x, let's um, consider the hypothesis. x is no potent. So I'll say there is an m greater than equal to 0, such that x to the m equals 0. So uh, I'll say let P be a prime ideal. Then I'll have x to the m equals 0 is in P. So that means x to the m is in P. So by the fact that this is a prime ideal, I can break up the product this way. And that means x is in p or x to the m minus 1 is in p. So we have uh, a decrease in the power of x. If I claim that x to the m minus 1 is in p, then that means x to the m minus, sorry, 2 times x is in p. And then we can repeat the process. Either x is in p or x to the m minus 1 m minus 2 is in p, if you keep going this way, x is in p, and you're done. The converse is a little bit trickier, but now that we have localization, it's not that bad. And so let's say that, suppose x is not no potent. Consider the ring <coughs> a sub x. Right. So consider this ring. I will say first of all that a sub x is not the zero ring. Why is that? Because um, one over one is not zero over one. So to prove that. If I claim that 1 over 1 is 0 over 1, then there is an S in 1F F squared, such that um, S times 1 times 1 minus 0 times 1, which is equal to S. You mean F or X for the set? Yes. Thank you. Sure. This is what happens when you switch terms. Yes. OK. Uh, so there's a power of x, a power of x, such that s is equal to 0. I don't know what s is, but it is some power of x. But we said that x is not no potent. So the identity is not the zero element. So that means that uh, there's more than one element in the ring. So uh, a sub x is not the zero ring. Okay, let's move on. 
So a sub x is not the zero ring. A sub x contains some prime ideal. But we proved it as maximal ideal originally. So that means, so there is a prime ideal. I'll say something like, I don't know, p sub x, where p is a prime. Did you mean the unique maximum idea or just a? It doesn't have to be unique because a sub x in my case is not a local ring, but it's just any maximum ideal, any maximum ideal. And all maximal ideals are prime ideals, so I can just relate it back to this correspondence I have. So I have some maximum ideal, it's a prime, I'll call P sub X, P isn't prime ideal of A, such that P cannot uh, intersect with uh, the powers of X. But that's exactly what we want to prove. We want to prove that uh, X is not contained every prime ideal. QED. So uh, using localization, I proved some very nice fundamental idea about um, rings, ring theory. So that was very good. Uh, any questions so far about localizing at um, I'm a little bit uh, rings. confused. I mean, just a mathematical part. So mm -hmm. as long as we consider the localization ring AX, yep. is that the local ring or not? No, uh, it's a local ring if you localize at a prime, but it's not always Ah, uh, it was just not just the element. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, 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 maybe I should have been clear. Yes, um, yes. So um, in the last case we were working with, um, localizing at an element is just localizing at the set of the powers of the element X. And it has no necessarily no consequences about the new localization. It could be a local ring, could not. Many strange things can happen, so it's not um, necessary. So in that case, I'm a little bit just confused for the existence of the maximum idea. So for the yeah. integral domain, I don't have a no confusion for that. But this is just a competitive ring. I mean, AX, yes. AX right? Yes, AX is a, a commutative ring, so it contains is it guaranteed some, for yes. the existence. A, 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 a non-zero commutative ring has a maximal ideal. At Based on John's lemma, right? Sorry. Based on John's lemma. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Ah, mm -hmm. so just a common ring is sufficient to guarantee the existence. Non-zero. Non-zero commutative ring. Uh -huh. yes. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that part of I was a little confused. Got it. Thanks. Yes. Yes, so Zorn's lemma is something we mentioned, but we didn't do it in detail. But yes, Zorn's lemma is one way to prove that uh, every non-zero ring has some maximal ideal and thus some prime ideal. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So this statement is fundamental. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about uh, localizing rings. We can also uh, localize at modules. Sorry, there was some sound. Um, uh, where was I? So uh, we can also build modules of fractions. Oh, sorry. So before uh, we were localizing um, rings, why can't we localize uh, groups and modules? So do the same thing. Let M be an A module in this case, S a multiplicatively closed subset of A. And S has the same properties. One is an element of S, and in two elements of S, the product is a element of S. So um, we can localize um, M at S. by saying this. Uh, this is elements of the form. So again, it's just like you're thinking of fractions. In this case, numerators are elements of the module and um, denominators are elements of the 
multiply multiply close subset S. So <clears throat> this is nice. Again, M over S, M prime over S prime are equal if and only if there is an element S double prime in S such that um, S double prime times uh, S times N prime minus S prime times M is zero. So uh, this is an element of uh, the module, the zero of the module, not the zero of the rank. So zero of the module, because these are all elements of a module. So that being said, uh, again, S inverse M is a module. I'm sorry, is a, I'll say, it's an S inverse A module by, so the first operation is the uh, uh, group operation. I'll say S, I'm sorry, M1 over S1 plus M2 over S2. You add um, these fractions like you always would. And then uh, in this case, if you're going to do the group operation, it behaves this way. So the natural idea. So in my case, uh, M1, M2, M prime are module elements. S1, S2, S and S prime are in S and then A is in in the rank A. Right. So, any questions? This is strange. So, like now it's like different uh, objects. One numerator is a module, and denominator is a ring, uh, a subset of a ring. So, uh, some algebraic operations. behave nicely uh, under uh, oh, sorry so uh, sometimes uh, localizing at s behaves very nicely so uh, I will say let a uh, I'm sorry, how about how I say let a be a ring? I'll say S a multiplicatively closed subset of A, and I'll say Uh, how about I say M and N are A modules? Then I'll say that first of all, the S inverse A module, uh, let's say S inverse M and S inverse A tensor M. Are isomorphic. So these two. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. These are, yeah. These two are both S inverse A modules, and they're isomorphic as S inverse A modules. And then also, um, these two modules are also S inverse A modules, and they're also isomorphic. Um, uh, sorry, this is a mistake. This is supposed to be S inverse A. So it seems like 
for a tensor product, um, localizing it S uh, doesn't change much. Like it behaves precisely like you would expect it to. So if you have this tensor product, localizing it S just distributes the S amongst both the modules. Okay. And so uh, we're nearing the end of the lecture before we start doing some practice problems. Uh, it's good to sometimes prove something using localization that you wouldn't necessarily see as part of the theory. So I will say, let's prove something before we move on to textbook examples. So any questions? Uh, everything's good. Okay. So uh, let A be a ring. Let's say M is a module. How about I ask that prove the following our equivalent. And this idea will uh, come up all the time in algebraic geometry, algebraic number theory, just commutative algebra, etc. Let's say M is the zero module. And so uh, localizing M at the ideal P so, I mean, you're not localizing at the set P, you're localizing at the complement of P. And M sub M, localizing at a maximum ideal. So, how do we prove this? Let's go the natural way. Um, like a cycle. So uh, how do you prove one to two, two to three, three to one? So clearly if you just have the zero module, localizing at a prime would still stay zero. There's no, you can't add any elements to the zero module just by localizing. And so one to two is clear. What about two to three? <clears throat> So if you look at number two, it says uh, m sub p is zero for all prime ideals of A. Well, all maximal, all maximal ideals are prime. So if all the primes already localized to zero, then should all the maximal ideals should already localize to zero. So the only real thing we have to prove is um, three to one, okay? So, <clears throat> Let's prove the contrapositive. So let's say uh, that M be a maximal ideal. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Um, I want to prove three to one. So I want to say uh, let M be a non zero A module. Then I claim. M sum M is non-zero for some maximal ideal uh, of A. Okay, so how do I do this? Uh, let X be an element of A that is non-zero. Okay, uh, consider the annihilator of X. These are all the elements of A such that A times X equals zero. Okay, the annihilator of X is an ideal of A. Okay, so next uh, we have that um, x is non-zero, so that means one times x is not zero. In other words, one is not an element of this ideal, the annihilator of x. So that means that the annihilator of x 
is a proper ideal. Let M be a maximal ideal um, containing the annihilator. I'm sorry, annihilator of X. I claim that um, M sub M is non zero. How do you prove that? Uh, I claim that I have a non zero element in the module, let's say x over 1. So how do I prove this claim? So if x over 1 equals 0 over 1, then um, there is some s and a complement m such that uh, s times x times 1 minus 0 times 1 equals 0. So uh, let's expand this um, term. This is just s times x equals 0. In other words, that means that s is an element of the annihilator of x because that's how the annihilator behaves. s times x equals 0. But um, and the annihilator of x was strictly contained in M. So the annihilator of x intersect A complement M is empty. So x s cannot be in uh, A complement M. It is a contradiction. So uh, that means that uh, A sub M is not zero because, um, I'm sorry, m sub m is non-zero because x over one is non-zero. Okay, so uh, we're done with the proof. So uh, notice that this property over here, this property of being zero is true if and only if localization at all the primes or all the maximal, uh, maximal ideals are also zero. So this property of being zero is unchanged whether or not you localize. So I will say a property P, I know I keep using P a lot, <clears throat> uh, property P that behaves this way is called a local property. In other words, if a module M has property P, if and only if M sub P has property, uh, okay, you know what? How about change property P to property Y? A property uh, is a local property. In other words, if M has property Y, if only if M sub P has property Y for all primes P, if only if M sub M has property Y. All maximal ideals. Huh. M. So a property such as Y is called a local property. Okay, so any questions? Yeah, in fact, I just uh, can see everything is so geometry. So. Yeah, yeah. You already understand some applications. If you just uh, realize. This is just the affine scheme, maybe. So yeah, so there are two choices for taking the open subset. One is localized with respect to the element F, which does not give the local link structure, but that is the just distinguished open subset. Whereas if we re localize with the prime idea P, that gives the local ring structure. And this local property really means about the 
localization in tiny little speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it totally makes sense. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad. Um, so uh, I'm done lecturing, um, okay. but I do have a couple of questions we can go over. Sure. Uh, how about what do you say? Uh, something really easy to start with. So um, this is the first question of the textbook. So it says, um, uh, let S be a multiplicatively closed subset of a ring A. Let M be a finally generated uh, A module. I want to prove that um, S in first M equals zero if only if there exists a single element S in S such that S times capital M equals zero. Or what I say. How do I find the solution to this? Uh, clearly, um, any uh, the right to left direction is easier than the left to right. Let me just look at my notes. Okay, so. Uh, let M be generated by some, uh, I'm sorry, no, okay, sorry. Uh, how about I say let X over S be an S inverse M? Ah, I'm sorry. Let X over Y be an S inverse M. I claim X over Y equals zero over one. That's clearly true because then we have s times x and one minus y times zero equals just s times x. But from here, that's clearly equal to zero. Okay, so right to left is proven. How about uh, left to right? How about I say suppose m is generated by um, these uh, elements of M. So I want to prove that S, in, I'm sorry, I want to prove there's one single element that annihilates every element of S inverse M. So uh, this is the hypothesis. So S inverse M equals zero. That means that X I over M equals zero for all I in, I'll say, how about this? So that means that there exists. Uh, what is S index I? Uh, so index, index I. Between I, one and N, what is N? Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. So there exists an SI for each XI such that uh, I'll say SI times XI equals zero. That's what it means for this to equal zero, right? So um, SI times XI times one minus zero times one equals SI times XI equals zero. Good. Okay. So multiply everything together. So I claim this S is this S I'm looking for. So then let M equal sum 
element of, oh, I'm sorry, I'll say y. Let y be some element of m. Okay, so now what? I claim s times is y equals zero. Why is that the case? Because s times y is the same as s times a1 x1 all the way to a m x m. I'll say this is, I don't know, some x bar times a1 times s1 times x1 plus all the way down to some s bar times a m times s m times x m. That means you're just adding up zeros and you're done. Okay, so we are done. Okay, and then I had another question we can do. Um, uh, it's very similar to what we did before we stopped lecturing. So let S be a multiplicatively closed subset of an integral domain. I'll say uh, A. Okay. So show that how about we say prove that M is torsion free. I will define torsion in a minute. Uh, I say to prove that the following are equivalent. M is torsion free. Okay. MP is torsion free for all primes P and MM is torsion free. Uh, sorry, for all maximal ideals. M. So again, this property of being torsion-free is a local property. How do we do this? So can you remind me what is the definition of torsion-free? Uh, yes, 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 sorry, yes. Uh, um, X in M is torsion if there exists S in, uh, how do I say, A in A such that A times X equals zero. Okay, so um, how do we prove this? Let's say M is torsion. Okay, and so then, uh, if I assume MP is not torsion free for some prime ideal, let's say P, then that means so there exists some X over S. I'll say, so there exists, how about some prime P, and let's say some X in A, some, I'm sorry, not X in A, so X in M, and S in A without P, such that X over S is torsion in uh, M sub P. So that means that there is some A over S prime, So that this is equal to zero. But what does that mean? That means, so there exists S double prime in S, uh, I'll say this is A over P, A mod A complement P, such that S double prime times one times A times X 
minus 0 times s times s prime equals 0. But if you expand this, this is a times s double prime times x equals 0. So what is going on? First of all, uh, we have, if we group it together like this, this means that a times s double prime times x equals 0, meaning that if a s double prime is not equals to zero, then x is torsion. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Let me write. Uh, x cannot be zero. So zero is always torsion. That's not, that doesn't mean anything. Torsion free means some non zero element is torsion. So, uh, if a s double prime is non-zero, then x is torsion. That's bad. So that means that a s double prime is equal to zero. But then that means that either, because it's an integral domain, either a is zero or s double prime is zero. So then that means that uh, s can't be zero. S double prime can't be zero because S double prime comes from A without P. A without P does not contain zero. Did we assume the ring is the integral domain? Yes, yes, we did. Ah, uh, uh, got it, got it. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, got it. Got integral it. domain, yes. Uh, so uh, S double prime can't be zero. So that means A must be zero. So that means a over s equals zero. That's exactly what I wanted to prove. So the only thing that you can multiply in times x to get zero is zero. That's good. Okay, so one to two is proven. What about two to three? Two to three is just logic. If uh, m sub p is torsion free for all prime ideals p, then all maximal primes being prime, m sub m for all maximal ideals m is torsion free. Now we have to prove the other direction. So we do the same exact thing we did before. Uh, let m be not torsion free. I claim I can find and now uh, I claim I can find a maximum ideal little m such that m sub little m is not torsion free. Okay. Uh, sorry, one sec. Ugh, what happened? Okay. I claim this is not torsion free for some maximal ideal. How do I prove this? We've done this proof before. So suppose x in m is torsion. What I'm trying to say is a is not zero, but a times x equals zero. Okay, so <clears throat> now what? So I claim now that x over one is not, sorry, I claim x over one is torsion. Clearly, I have that a over one times x over one equals, I'll say a x over one. This is equal to zero. That's very clear. First of all, x over one is zero if and only if there exists s in um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We haven't, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't told you what the maximum ideal is. Okay, let I be the annihilator of x. Like before. Yeah, repeat the same thing. Repeat the same thing. Got, uh, it. Got it. I is prime, our I is a proper ideal, then I is contained in the maximum ideal m. 
So I claim x over 1 and uh, m sub m is torsion and non-zero. So, uh, you know what? Let's stop here because the proof is clear. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah, co yeah. copy what we did yeah, yeah, yeah. half an hour. Yeah, skip ago. it. Yeah. Got it. Even though the idea is torsion and equal to zero are a little bit different, the proof, the yeah, got it. Logic is the same. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. So you wanna stop here? Yes, please. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. I really enjoy. Uh, how do I stop sharing the screen?